A-Level Paper 3, June 2019 Sodium thiosulfate reacts with hydrochloric acid as shown below. Give the simplest ionic equation for this reaction. So the important parts are the uh, sodium thiosulfate. So I've got sodium, sodium thiosulfate here, Na2S2O3. I know that sodium is in oxidation state plus 1, and there are two of them, 2 plus 1, so the S2O3 must be 2 minus. It's an ending, so Na is the beginning, S, uh, S2O3, 2 minus is an ending, so it must react with the H plus of the HCl. So I must have S2O3, 2 minus, H plus of the HCl. What I'm going to make, what does the S turn into? Well, it turns into sulfur dioxide and sulfur. And what can the H pluses and the O's turn into water? So I've just picked out these three things here. The sodium I'm not going to bother with, and the Cl I'm not going to bother with. The important parts are the uh, thiosulfate part and the H has got to react with it because that's a minus ion reacting with a plus ion or an ending reacting with the beginning. And I'm going to leave these two spectator ones out. Two H's, two H pluses. Let's just check the charges now. Two minus, two pluses, no charges on the right hand side. The SO2 is a pollutant. State the property of SO2 that causes pollution when it enters rivers. It causes acid rain, so it's acidic. Equation SO2 plus H2O, and you can just work out what's made. So that's H2SO3, it's sulfurous acid. There's a common fallacy that it makes sulfuric acid. It does, it oxidizes in the air when it comes down through the atmosphere, but it actually makes sulfurous acid, H2SO3, when the sulfur dioxide dissolves in the water. Draw a diagram to show the shape of a molecule of H2O. Well, O has got six electrons in its outer shell, two bonding pairs and two lone pairs, therefore. So the two lone pairs can be shown like that. You can also show them as sort of pear-shaped bulbs if you want to as well. But the two lone pairs repel uh, to the greatest extent and the lone pair to the bonding pair to the next greatest extent. And then the least repulsion is between the two bonding pairs. So it goes down from something tetrahedral like CH4 from 109.5 to something with one lone pair and three bonding pairs like ammonia to 107 um, from 109.5 to 107 down by 2.5 and then when you get two bonding pairs and two lone pairs it comes down by another 2.5 from 107.5 to 100 uh, 107 to 104.5. So the bond angle is 104.5 and the explanation is that the lone pairs repel two uh, Two lone pairs repel more than a lone pair and a bonding pair, uh, which is more than two bonding pairs. So the bond angle is lowered to 104.5 from that in a tetrahedral, which is 109.5. The initial rate of reaction between sodium thiosulfate and hydrochloric acid can be monitored by measuring the time taken for a fixed amount of sulfur. Sulfur is a solid. It's a yellow solid. Describe an experiment to investigate the effect of temperature. So I'm changing temperature on the initial rate of this reaction. So if I'm making a solid, the easiest way to measure the amount of solid that's made is to mix it in a conical flask, put the conical flask onto a, um, a cross on a piece of paper and measure the time taken for the cross to disappear. Um, I'm going to change the temperature every time, so I'm going to vary the temperature each time. I'm probably going to do it in a conical flask. I'm going to start a stopcock when I mix the two together, when I add the sodium thiosulfate and the hydrochloric acid. So I'm going to put a conical flask containing the thiosulfate onto a piece of paper with a cross. I'm going to add the acid and start the stop clock. In terms of measurements, I'm going to repeat it at different temperatures. And the time how long it takes the cross to disappear, as I said, because solid sulfur is made, which obscures the cross so that you can't see the cross through the mixture anymore. Keep everything else constant, that's important. So the cross um, is going to be kept constant because if you use, you know, I don't know, a pencil and then a biro and then a thick marker pen, uh, that will change things because you'll be able to see it um, to vary in different amounts through the mixture. Uh, the volumes of all the chemicals and the concentrations of all the chemicals. And then to, you want to plot um, rate against temperature. Now rate is the opposite of time because if time is um, time goes quickly so uh, the rate of something 
if, if time goes quickly, so if it's a small time, if something uh, the cross obscures, let's say, in one second, then the rate is very high. If something takes uh, 60 seconds to obscure, the rate is very low. So time is inversely proportional, is the opposite to rate. So you need to do 1 divided by time to work out the rate. Question 2. The question is about sulfuric acid and its salts. Draw the displayed form of a molecule of sulfuric acid. Now you should know this from electrophilic addition across the double bond when you've done electrophilic addition. So you should know that a sulfur has got two OHs and two uh, S to double bond O's. In aqueous solution, sulfuric acid acts as strong acid. The H2SO4 dissociates to form HSO4 minus ions and H plus ions. Give an equation for that. Easy enough. Uh, Given equation to show uh, the HSO4 ions act as a weak acid and dissociate to form SO42 minus ions. So if it's acting as an acid, it produces another H plus. So the HSO4 minus ion now produces SO42 minus and another H plus. So it's producing H pluses. Both these are acting as acids. A student is required to make 250 cm cubed of an aqueous solution that contains accurately measured mass of sodium hydrogen sulfate. Doesn't tell you what the mass is, I don't think that matters, because you're just about asked about the method. So what you first of all got to do is you've got to get yourself a beaker or a conical flask and put it onto a balance and press the tear button so it zeroes it. Then you weigh your sodium hydrogen carbonate into the conical flask. That's good. That's important that you press the tear rather than take two readings because you, every time you take a reading then you get um, increased error. So using the tear is important. Although actually if you said you took two readings before and after and subtracted, you won't lose a mark. Uh, but it's better to press the tear and therefore you'll reduce the errors because you're only taking one reading. Uh, then you've got to, in the conical flask, you add distilled water and dissolve it all in the conical flask. Uh, you don't transfer it into the volumetric flask until it's dissolved. It's far easier to stir and dissolve it in a conical flask rather than in a volumetric flask. It's hard to dissolve something in a volumetric flask. So you make sure it's dissolved first of all in the conical flask. Then you transfer it into the volumetric flask. Important you wash the conical flask because um, you want to try and wash out any any uh, remaining solution out there with distilled water and put it into the volumetric flask. Then you make up to the 250 centimeter cube mark and then shake it to make sure the last parts, uh, any, any last uh, remnants of sodium hydrocarbonate are dissolved and that it's equally mixed throughout the solution. A solution contains 6.05 grams of sodium hydrogen sulfate in a 100 centimetre cube and has a pH of 1.72. Um, so you've got a number of things to do first straight off here. You've got a mass in milligrams. Um, to get milligrams up into grams, then you have to divide it by 1,000, so 0 0.605 grams. You can work out the MI, you can work out the number of moles of this. You've got 100 centimetre cubes, so you can work out the concentration. You've got a pH, so pH equals minus log to the base 10 of H plus concentration. If you're given a pH, you must have to work out H plus. So we can do all those things first of all. So initial number of moles of hydrogen, sulfa hydrogen sulfate. Um, so moles equals mass divided by MR. I've turned that into grams by dividing by 1000, 0 0.605. I've worked out the MR of sodium hydrogen sulfate, 120.1. Divide the two, 5.05, uh, 5.04 times 10 to the minus 3 are the number of moles of sodium hydrogen sulfate. Now sodium hydrogen sulfate is going to make hydrogen sulfate ions. It tells you that, more or less, the hydrogen sulfate ions are made when you dissolve this in water. So it'll make Na plus and HSO4 minus. So the number of moles of HSO4 minus are the same. And then you can work out concentration of HSO4 minus or the sodium hydrogen sulfate for that matter. Um, it's the number of moles divided by the volume in decimeter cubed, 100 centimeter cubed up into decimeter cubed up into a high unit value divided by 1000, 0.1. And it comes out as 5.04 times 10 to the minus two. So I've got the concentration. now got pH, uh, pH 1.72. The only reason you'd be given pH is because pH equals minus log to the base 10 of H plus concentration. Uh, reverse the signs on both sides, so minus 1.72 equals log 10 of H plus concentration, then inverse log minus 1.72, and you'll work out the H plus concentration. It should come out as 0 0.0191. 
Now I've just written a, a simple sort of equilibrium here, HSO4 minus. We know from the previous question anyway, makes SO4 2 minus and H plus. There's usually a link between questions. So HSO4 minus makes H pluses. So that's where the H plus are coming from. So I've written an equilibrium constant here, H plus concentration, SO4 2 minus concentration. There are the concentration on the right hand side divided by the concentration of SO4 minus on the bottom. Have we got H plus concentration? Yes, 0.0191. Uh, Have we got sulfate? Well, every time a H plus is made, a sulfate is made. So one mole of sulfate is made at the same time as one mole of H plus. So the concentrations of these must be equal. So that must be 0 0.191. And the hard bit, I suppose, now is to work out HSO4 minus. Well, you know the number of moles of HSO4 minus at the beginning is um, 5.04 times 10 to the minus 3. So you know that 5.04 times 10 to the minus 3 is the number of moles at the beginning. Um, you know the uh, concentration is 5.04 times 10 to the minus 2. The concentration of H plus is 0 0.191. So if you subtract the 2, because every time... Um, H plus is made, then um, HSO4 is used up. So if you subtract the two, you'll work out the concentration of HSO4 minus, um, and um, therefore that equals 0 0.0313. So you can put that in and you can work out Ka equals 0 0.0117 or 1.17 times 10 to the minus 2. I've put it to three significant figures because of things like 1.72, 605 milligrams, 100 centimeter cubed are also to three significant figures. But the hard part is working out the uh, HSO4 minus concentration by subtraction of what it was at the beginning, 5.04 times 10 to the minus 3, subtract the concentration of H plus uh, to work out 0.313. Once you're there, then the rest of it uh, is quite straightforward. The units, concentration multiplied by concentration, so moles divided by decimeter cubed multiplied by moles divided by decimeter cubed, divided by moles divided by decimeter cubed, another concentration, top and bottom, concentration on the top and the concentration on the bottom cancel. So a mole and a mole and dm3 and a dm3 cancel. So the, the units are mole divided by dm3. Or if you take the dm3 um, from the bottom to the top, it comes mole dm to the minus 3. Some sodium sulfate is dissolved in a sample of the solution. So what does the sodium sulfate do? So sulfate ions... Hydrogen sulfate makes sulfate ions in H+. So if I add extra sulfate ions, by Le Chatelier's principle, it's going to try and lower the uh, concentration of sulfate ions. So if I increase the concentration of sulfate ions here or here by adding more sulfate ions, sodium sulfate, by Le Chatelier's principle, it will try and lower the concentration of those and it will shift the position of equilibrium to the left-hand side. In doing so, it will lower the H+, plus concentration, H+, plus concentration, H plus is, is, is acid, acids make H plus, so if I lower the H plus concentration, it's going to become more basic or more alkali, and the pH um, will therefore increase. Question 3. Figure 1 represents the cell used to measure the standard electrode potential for the Fe3 plus Fe2 plus electrode, which is this beaker on the right hand side. Name the piece of apparatus labelled A. A is a salt bridge uh, with something like potassium chloride in that's going to allow the ions to move between the compartments and complete the circuit. State the purpose of A. It's going to allow the ions to move or flow to complete the circuit. Name the substance used as electrode B. So you want something that's inert like platinum. Identify C, D and E in the conditions for each. So C is some acid like hydrochloric acid and it's got to be at one mole per decimeter cubed. D is hydrogen gas and it's got to be at 100 kilopascals and 298 Kelvin. So 100 kilopascals is normal room pressure and 298 Kelvin is 25 degrees C or normal uh, room temperature. 
and E is the solution of Fe3 plus and Fe2 plus. And that's got to be at one mole per decimeter cubed as well. Now you could name some, you could put Fe3 plus and Fe2 plus ions, and that would get you the mark, or you could name it something like FeCl2, which is Fe iron 2 chloride and FeCl3 iron 3 chloride. You could name other soluble iron uh, salts as well, or you could just put Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus if you wished. The standard electropotential for this electrode is 0 0.77. Give the ionic equation for the overall reaction in the cell. State the change that needs to be made in the apparatus to allow the cell to go to completion. Well, the hydrogen gas, H2, is going to go to H+, plus, and at the same time, your Fe3+, plus will go to Fe2+. Plus. So hydrogen goes to H+, plus, and Fe3+, plus goes to 2+. Plus. You know Fe3+, plus goes to 2+, plus because this here is oxidized so the other one must be reduced so zero oxidation state to plus one the hydrogen has been oxidized so it's going to act as a reducing agent and reduce the fe3 plus down to fe2 plus how can you make sure the reaction goes to completion you remove the voltmeter removing the voltmeter allows the reaction to go to completion now you've got to plot these points on the graph and it will look like this. So you've got to work out natural log of concentration of, of zinc 2 plus and copper 2 plus in this, uh, this uh, cell now. So um, a different cell. You've got to work out the missing value here. So if I do uh, Zn2 plus concentration 1 divided by 0 0.1 and then I natural log it, it will come out as 2.3. So that's 2.3 in there. And then it says plot a graph of um, these values here, 1.16 down to 1.04. So if it says plot a graph of something, the first thing that it mentions is on the y-axis. So 1.16 down to 1.04, you don't need to go down to zero. If you go down to zero, then it's not going to fill up half the page and you're going to lose a mark. Um, and the other values here go from minus 4.61 to plus 4.61. So you might as well go minus 5 to plus 5. That's what I've done there. Uh, suitable scales, points plotted, line the best fit and using at least half of the uh, page uh, will get you all of those marks. I've got a complicated equation here that's been given to you. Um, The electrode potential of the cell equals minus 4.3 times 10 to the minus 5 multiplied by T, where T is temperature, multiplied by uh, natural log of concentration of Zn2 plus divided by na uh, concentration of copper 2 plus plus a constant, um, the standard electrode potential. Um, anyway, you've not really got to use this that much. You've just got to work out that it equals Y equals MX plus C. So my y value equals mx plus c. So my y value is this one. This part in brackets must be m. m is the gradient of the graph. When x, this part is x plus a constant. So what it's basically telling you is that minus 4.3 times 10 to the minus 5 multiplied by temperature t is the gradient. So once you work out your gradient, your gradient is the change in y, so it's going from 1.16 down to 1.04, so that's 0.12. So 0.12 divided by um, this value here, which is ooh, almost 10, so 4.61 plus 4.61, it's uh, 9.22. So it's um, 0 0.12 divided by 9.22, and it comes out as a value of minus 0 0.13. Remember, if your values, if you if you um, line of best fit, if you if you're working out a gradient, it's coming down this way. It's a minus value. If it's going up this way, it's a positive value. So if it looks if it's going uphill, it's a a positive value of it looks as if it's going downhill, it's a minus value. So the gradient is minus 0 0.13, and the gradient equals all of this value here, minus 4.3 times 10 to the minus 5 multiplied by t. Uh, take this across to the side, so t is um, 
minus 0 0.013 divided by minus 4.3 times 10 to the minus 5, and it'll come out around about 302, 303, and it's in Kelvin. Okay. Um, in experiment two, the electropotential of the copper uh, Cu2 plus to copper electrode is plus 0 0.33. Um, use the data in the table to calculate electropotential for the Zn2 uh, plus to Zn electrode in experiment 2. So I've got to look at experiment 2. In experiment 2, the overall electropotential is 1.13. So I've got to work out what my value of if the copper 2 plus going to copper is plus 0 0.33, I've got to work out what Zn uh, 2 plus to Zn is. It must be a negative value. So it's minus, if these two, if this is a negative value, it means it's going to go the other way. So I'm going to reverse the sign on this and it'll become plus 0 0.8, plus 0 0.8 added to plus uh, 0.33 gives me the value in experiment 2, which is 1.13. Um, Okay, give one reason why uh, the calculated value is different from the standard electropotential using non-standard conditions. For a start, the temperature is not at 298 Kelvin. Question 4. Ethanol reacts with potassium cyanide followed by dilute acid to form 2-hydroxypropane nitrile. So I've drawn ethanol here. I've drawn a cyanide ion, so potassium cyanide which needs to be in methanol and water, by the way. In methanol and water, um, the potassium um, is just a spectator ion. You don't draw that. You put Cn with a minus. The minus can be anywhere. And there's a lone pair of electrons on the C. The, lone, the arrow goes from the lone pair of electrons to this C, which is delta plus, because this is a polar bond with the O more electronegative than the C. Uh, bonds to that C. The double bond, the electrons from uh, the double bond go onto the O, so that creates a single bond. There's the pair of electrons that have just moved onto the O, and it becomes minus because it's had electrons moved onto it. And the CN has bonded on. It's lost its minus charge because it's had electrons move away from it. Now here's the acid, uh, followed by dilute acid. Acids make H pluses, and the lone pair of electrons on the O bond to the H and make OH. The O has had electrons move away from it, so it loses its minus, and the H plus had electrons move on to it, so it loses its plus. And there we go, and that's made 2-hydroxypropane nitrile now. Name the mechanism. Well, uh, this is a nucleophile. It's an electron pair donor, um, and everything is added together, nucleophilic addition. The 2-hydroxypropane nitrile formed in a reaction is a mixture of equal amounts of two isomers. Uh, yes, it's got a chiral carbon. It's got four different groups attached to that central carbon there. It's got a chiral or an asymmetric carbon atom. So these are going to have mirror images and enantiomers which rotate plane polarized light um, in opposite directions. Um, it's a mixture of equal amounts, but if, if the two enantiomers are in equal amounts, that's called a racemic mixture. And the reason it's a racemic mixture and got equal amounts is because this cyanide ion has got an equal chance of attack from above or below. If it attacks from above, it makes one enantiomer, one mirror image. If it attacks from below, it makes the other uh, mirror image. So you get 50% of each, equal amounts of each, because there's an equal chance of attack from above and below. That's because this C double bond O is planar. So there's an equal chance of attack from each side or above or below. 3D representations of this, so I've got to draw this as a 3D shape. It does say 3D representations, so I've drawn the OH and the CH just flat against the plane. I've, I've drawn the H coming out and the CN going back, but you could have these in any way that you want, as long as then that's mirrored perfectly. N, N, C, 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 O, H, O, H. Really, that should be H, O there should be HO, but you probably get the mark for that, CH3, CH3. So these should be uh, exactly reversed, but you'll still get the mark for those if they're not exactly reversed. As long as the OH and the OH are at the top, C is in the middle, CH3 are to either side, it's far away left and right, the CN are in the middle, and the H are coming forward. You'll get the marks for it. 2-hydroxypropane two nitrile can be used for the synthesis of the monomer um, in the synthesis of the monomer acrylonitrile. Um, 
Okay, suggest a suitable reagent conditions for the conversion of 2-hydroxypropane nitrile into acrylonitrile. 2-hydroxy, you've got an OH group, and you turn it into a double bond, you're removing water, you're dehydrating it, and it's something like concentrated hydrochloric acid. You're going to have to heat that up, so you're going to have to reflux it. You need about 170 degrees C, but as long as you put heat, then that will get you the mark. So concentrated sulfuric acid and heat, you need to reflux it. Draw a section of the polymer polyacrylonitrile shown three repeating units. Okay, so we look at the double bond here and we look at what's coming off it. So I've got a C to C double bond. I've got an H and an H and on this C I've got an H and a CN. I draw three of those, then I break the double bonds and I join them together. So I've had a double bond here. I've had an H and an H. These are these two H's here. I've had an H up and a CN down, let's say, here. And there's been a double bond and the double bond broke and it kept it formed two single bonds. It says that it wants three of those units joined together, so I've drawn a second unit and a third unit and joined them together as such. Question 5. The percentage by mass of iron in steel wire is determined by a student. The student takes 680 milligrams or 0.68 grams of the wire with an excess of sulfuric acid so that all the iron in the wire forms Fe2+. Plus. Makes up the volume of Fe2 plus 200 cm3, takes 25 cm3 portions, titrates each portion with 0.02 mole per decimeter cube potassium manganate 7 solution. Give the overall give the equation for the reaction between iron and sulfuric acid. Well iron's Fe, sulfuric acid is H2SO4. Uh, a metal and an acid always give hydrogen gas, and we know that it makes Fe2 plus sulfate ions are SO4 2 minus. So it's going to be FeSO4. Calculate the mean titer from these titration results. Titrate, titer is a volume. So let's have a look at the volumes that we've got. Uh, titration number 1 gave 22.90, 22.70 from titration number 2, and titration number 3, 22.60. For concordant results, i.e. those are uh, results that are close enough for us to use, they must be no more than 0.1 apart. Well, 1 and 2... 0.2 apart, so they're no good. 2 and 3 are 0.1 apart. So we're going to ignore titration number 1 and just take an average, a mean, uh, another word for an average, of uh, titrations 2 and 3. 22.70 added 22.60 divided by 2, because there's only two titrations that we're actually using, gives 22.65 centimetre cubed. Give the overall ionic equation for the oxidation of Fe2 plus by manganate 7 ions in acidic conditions. So what you actually do here is, Fe2, you've got to write half equations and balance them to get the overall ionic equation. Fe2 plus and it goes to Fe3 plus. So the Fe2 plus is going to be oxidised by the manganate 7 ions, that's an oxidising agent, to Fe3 plus. And for a half equation I've got to add electrons to one side or the other to balance up the charges. 2 plus on the left, 3 plus on the right, electrons are minuses, so I'll add an electron on the right hand side. MnO4 minus um, goes to form Mn2 plus manganese 2 ions. But the problem is, what do I do with the four O's? A little trick that I can always do is I can always add H pluses and I can always add waters. I can always add those at any time that I want. So where can the four O's go to? Well, I'm only allowed to add H pluses and waters. So let's add some waters. That gives a place for the uh, O's to go to. I'm going to put four in front of it to get balance up the four O's. That creates eight H's, so the eight H pluses then must be on the left-hand side. So remember, I'm always allowed to add H plus in uh, waters if I need to to balance a half equation. Let's add up the number of plus and minuses on the left hand side and decide how many electrons I need. And I'm going to need five electrons on the left. Let's check. One minus seven, eight plus. That gives seven plus overall. On the right hand side, there's two plus. So I'm going to need five minuses on this side. So a minus and eight uh, plus is a seven plus. Five minuses give two plus to balance with the two plus on the right hand side. Now, I add everything on the left and everything on the right, and then I cancel anything left and right. But before I do that, I've got to get the electrons to be able to cancel. So I've got to get the same number of electrons uh, in both of these half equations. So I'm going to multiply this one by 5. 5 Fe2 plus 5 Fe3 plus of 5 electrons. The other one stays the same. So that when I add everything on the left, at 5 Fe2 plus MnO4 minus 8H plus of 5 electrons, and then everything on the right, Fe2 plus plus 5 electrons, 4 H2O of Mn2 plus, there's the same number of electrons on each side to cancel, and it ends up with this equation here. 
state the colour change seen at the end point of the titration. Well, what's actually happened is um, MN2 plus are colourless, um, or very, very, very pale pink. They're pretty much colourless. But as soon as I add a drop of manganate, manganate 7 solution, which is purple, it will make the solution purple. So that's how I know that the end point has happened and that all of the Fe2 plus has been oxidised to Fe3 plus. But one more drop of uh, Mn2 plus creates a colour. Now it's going to be very, very pale purple. You don't want to run an awful lot more through, just one more drop and then stop it, otherwise your titrations are going to be wrong. So just maybe one drop uh, excess um, after the end point when all the Fe2 plus has been oxidised to Fe3 plus. So it's going to be a very, very, very pale purple. Name the piece of apparatus used for the stage of this method. To take 25 centimetre cube portions and use a pipette. Add in potassium permanganate solution, use a burette. The balance to weigh the 680 milligrams of iron has an uncertainty of plus or minus 0.005. A container was weighed and its mass was subtracted from the total mass of the container of the wire. So, you've got the container weighed first of all, you know the mass of the container, and then you've got the the mass of the container with the with the wire in it, and you subtract the two to get the, the wire. You've got two results there, two readings. So what you do is you take uh, the percentage uncertainty and multiply it by the number of readings. That's times two is 0 0.01. So because I've got two readings, the uncertainty is doubled. And then the percentage error is the uncertainty divided by the mass of the iron that I use. So uh, now then, this is in grams, so I'm saying that it's 0 0.005 times 2 grams is the uncertainty, so this got to be in grams. A small unit value like milligrams up into grams divided by 1000, 0 0.68, and I multiply by 100% to get a percentage, 1.47%. Um, everything here is three significant figures. 680 milligrams, so let's have that as three significant figures to 1.47%. Question 6. Which amount of sodium hydroxide would react exactly with 7.5 grams of a diprotic acid, uh, MR150? Well, I've got a mass and I've got an MR, so I can work out number of moles. Moles is mass divided by MR, 7.5 divided by 150 is going to give me 0.05, that's the number of moles of the diprotic acid. What a diprotic acid means is that uh, it's got uh, that um, one mole of the acid reacts with two moles of the sodium hydroxide. It's almost like a, you can think double strength acid, it's got two acids, maybe it's like sulfuric acid where it releases two moles of H plus, or it's got two carboxylic acid groups or something. But uh, one mole of the acid reacts with uh, two moles of the sodium hydroxide. So, which amount of sodium hydroxide, if I've worked out the number of moles of acid, I multiply by two to work out the number of moles of sodium hydroxide that I've got. 0 0.1 moles of sodium hydroxide is going to be needed. So, concentration equals moles divided by volume. So, moles is concentration times volume. And I've got concentration and volumes here. I need to get these volumes into decimeter cube, so by dividing by a thousand, and then once I've divided each of these by a thousand and multiplied by the concentrations, I'll work out the number of moles. The answer is C, because um, uh, moles is concentration times volume. Concentration is 1 divided by 0 0.1 decimeter cubed is 0 0.1, and that matches the number of moles of sodium hydroxide that I need. Question 7. Lead nitrate and potassium iodide react according to this equation in the experiment. 25 centimetre cubed of a 0 0.1 mole per decimetre cubed solution of each compound are mixed together. So I've been given a volume and a concentration. They clearly want me to work out moles. So moles is concentration times volume. Um, concentration is 0 0.1. Volume is going to be in decimeter cubed. So centimeter cubed up into a unit value, a high unit value of decimeter cubed divided by 1000, 0 0.025. I've got 0 0.025 of each reactant. So which one is going to be limiting? Well, I need twice as much of this, 2 moles of potassium iodide, Ki, for every 1 mole of this. So this is going to be the limiting factor. This is what I need more of. 
this is what's going to limit it. Um, some of this will be left over because I don't need as much of this. I need twice as much of this, so this is the limiting factor. So I've got 0 0.0025 moles of both of these, but this is the limiting uh, reactor. 0 0.0025 moles of potassium iodide is going to make half as much of the lead iodide. Uh, it's asking for the lead to iodide, which is PBI2. Uh, so 0 0.0025 moles of Ki which is my limiting uh, reactant, makes 0 0.00125. I've divided by 2 because 2 moles make 1. I divided by 2, so it's going to make 0 0.00125 moles of lead iodide, which is 1.25 times 10 to the minus 3. The answer is A. Nitrogen monoxide is produced from ammonia and air, as shown in these equations. 4 moles of ammonia, 5 moles of oxygen make 4 moles of NO and 6 H2O. And the enthalpy change for that is minus 909. It's exothermic with a minus value. It's giving out 909 kilojoules for every mole um, that I react. Um, so this 4NO then goes on to react here. Now I've only got 2NO here. So the 4NO goes to react here, but I need 4NO reacting, not 2NO. 4NO is coming through from step one. So I'm going to have to multiply all of this times, multiply by 2. 4NO, 2O2, 4NO2 because I've got 4NO made in step 1, so I need 4NO reacting then in step 2. So I'm going to multiply this enthalpy change by 2, because I've got twice as much reacting, so the enthalpy change, instead of giving out minus 115 kilojoules per mole, it'll give out twice that. So my overall change is minus 909 uh, plus 2 multiplied by 115, which is minus 1139. And the answer is D for this overall enthalpy change of a two-step reaction. Question 9. Which change leads to a higher concentration of SO3 in the equilibrium mixture? In other words, shift the position of equilibrium to the right-hand side. A higher concentration of O2 will, by Lischer's principle, it will try and oppose that change, lower the concentration of O2, and react some of it away to make more SO3. So A is your immediate answer. Let's just check. Higher temperature by Lesch-Teller's principle will try and lower the temperature. Well, it's an exothermic reaction, so it won't shift it to the right-hand side to make more heat. The shift it to the left-hand side. B is wrong. Lower the pressure. Well, I've got three moles on the left and two moles on the right. So increasing the pressure would shift the equilibrium to the right-hand side to try and lower the volume. So lowering the pressure would go to the left-hand side. Use of a catalyst, well, that doesn't change the equilibrium position at all. All it does is speed up the forward and backward reactions equally. So your answer is A. The results of an investigation reaction between P and Q are shown, and I've got a rate equation. So what I do is I take 0 0.2 and I divide it by 0 0.6 and I raise it to the power uh, that P is with respect to, which is a 1. And then I multiply that by 0 0.5 divided by this value here that I don't know. I'll call that concentration Q and I raise it to the power uh, that Q is with respect to, to a 2. And then I divide 0 0.4 by 0 0.8. So 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.6 to the power 1, because P is with respect to 1. 0 0.5 divided by Q. Q is the thing that I'm trying to calculate. Squared, because Q, our order with respect to Q is a 2, divided by 0 0.5. 0 0.4 divided by 0 0.8. So I'm just dividing each of these. Now these are going to give fractions, so I'm going to flip everything over. Instead of 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.6, I'm going to have 0 0.6 divided by 0 0.2. I'm going to flip this over the concentration of Q, which I'm trying to calculate, divided by 0 0.5 squared still. And instead of 0 0.4 divided by 0 0.8, 0 0.8 divided by 0 0.4, that gives me uh, better numbers. This is 3 to the power 1 equals Q divided by 0 0.5 squared. 0 0.8 divided by 0 0.4 is 2. Divided at both sides by 3. So um, Q concentration of Q divided by 0 0.5 squared is 2 thirds. Square root everything. Square root of 2 thirds, 0 0.6667 um, six, 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 is 0 0.82. That's the square root. Uh, multiply both sides by 0 0.5. 0 0.82 multiplied by 0 0.5 is 0 0.41. So that's close to answer C. 
Equation between sulfur dioxide and oxygen is shown below. In the experiment, two moles of sulfur dioxide are reacted with two moles of oxygen. The total amount of the three gases at equilibrium is 3.4. So it tells me how much sulfur dioxide I put in at the beginning, how many moles of oxygen I put in the beginning. Uh, I've got no SO3 made, but at the end, the total number of uh, moles of gases at the end is 3.4. What is the mole fraction of sulfur dioxide in the equilibrium mixture? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the, the amount, number of moles of SO3 is X. So I'll say the number of moles of SO3 is X. Since two moles of SO2 make two moles of SO3, the same number of moles of SO3, the number of moles of SO3 that are made are the same as the number of moles of SO2 that are used up. So if I start with two moles of S sulfur trioxide and I'm making X number of moles of SO3, I must have used up X number of moles of SO2 to make X number of moles of SO3. So my moles of SO2 is two take away X. Number of moles of oxygen is half the amount of SO3. So, um, so half an X, 0.5 X gets used up from the initial amount of oxygen. So two take away 0.5 X is the amount of O2 that's used up. Total number of moles is 3.4. Um, and the total number of moles of each of these in terms of X is X number of SO3 uh, plus two take away X number of moles of SO2 plus two take away 0.5 X number of moles of O2. And that equals the total value of 3.40 moles of gas in total it tells you that in the question so i'm going to say x take away x is nothing two add two is four four take away 0.5 x equals this value 3.4 um, take minus 0.5 x across the other side and take the 3.5 across the other side so 0.5 x now equals four take away 3.4 which is 0.6 uh, divide both sides by 0.5, x is 1.2. So the mole fraction is the amount of x, or the amount of SO3, uh, divided by the total uh, number of moles of gases in the mixture. 1.2 divided by 3.4 is 0.335. So my answer is B. Nitrogen reacts with hydrogen in an exothermic reaction, so this is exothermic. Which, con which change increases the equilibrium yield of ammonia but has no effect on the value of the equilibrium constant? Well, first of all, the only thing that affects, the only condition that affects the equilibrium constant is temperature. So as long as I don't change the temperature, there's going to be no effect on the equilibrium constant. But if I change temperature, it's going to affect the equilibrium constant. Now, we want a condition that's not going to affect the equilibrium constant. So a decrease in the temperature will affect the equilibrium constant. So I'm going to rule that one out. Uh, changing the equilibrium yield, well, a catalyst won't work. So I can rule that one out. A catalyst speeds up the forward and the backward reaction by an equal amount. It's not going to increase the yield of one product over another one substance over another in the equilibrium mixture so it's not a either it's either b or d increase the partial pressure of nitrogen if you increase the partial pressure of nitrogen by let's try this principle try and reduce the partial pressure of nitrogen by reacting some of it away and making more ammonia so your answer is b let's just check decrease the total pressure no increase in the total pressure i've got four moles of gas on the left only two on the right increasing the pressure by let's try this principle can lower the pressure by reducing the volume so my answer is B. Question 13. Um, what is the EMF of the cell Fe going to Fe2 plus and Cu2 plus going to copper? Well, I've got Cu2 plus going to copper is plus uh, 0 0.34. Uh, Fe going to Fe2 plus. I need to reverse that sign to be instead of minus 0 0.44, it needs to be plus 0 0.44, plus 0 0.44, Add 0.34 is 0.78. The answer is A. Which atom has the fir greatest first ionization energy? So an atom with the greatest first ionization energy is going to have the highest nuclear charge and the smallest size. So I'm looking for something in, in um, at the top of the periodic table. So uh, because lithium and neon have additional shells, uh, electron shells, 
over and above uh, hydrogen and helium so they would have increased shielding so i'm looking for something that's very small it's either hydrogen or helium as i go left to right across a period the size of the atom decreases because i get more protons and increased uh, nuclear charge so my answer is helium b that's the smallest atom of those what is the correct observation when barium metal is added to an excess of water well when any metal is added to water if it reacts then uh, i get hydrogen gas so i'm going to get effervescence so i'm looking for either b or d and i'm going to get barium hydroxide now barium hydroxide as a go down period to the hydroxides get more soluble so i'm going to get a color solution which effervesces Question number 16. An aqueous solution of a salt gives a white precipitate when mixed with silver nitrate. So if silver nitrate tests for chlorides. Uh, it will give silver chloride as a white precipitate. So I'm looking at either A or C. Um, and then also gives uh, a precipitate when mixed with sulfuric acid. So uh, barium sulfate is um, so barium sulfate is a, a white solid used in barium meals so that you x-ray uh, soft tissues potassium sulfate is soluble all sodium and potassium salts are soluble so my answer is a which statement is not correct about the trends in properties of hydrogen halides from HCl to HI well, as I go down the group the molecules are getting bigger if they're getting bigger there's more van der Waals forces if they get more van der Waals forces then the boiling point is going to increase the boiling point decreases no that's wrong so my answer straight away is a which uh, what is observed when concentrated hydrochloric acid is added to an aqueous solution of copper sulfate well copper sulfate when dissolved in water is hexa aqua copper um, two which is blue uh, and then when I add hydro hydrochloric acid, then the six water ligands get replaced by four uh, chloro ligands. Only four chloro ligands can fit around it, and it will change to a yellowy green colour. And it is soluble because it has a charge. So my answer is changes colour and no precipitate forms. My answer is D. Question 19. What's the su most suitable reagent for detecting the presence of carbonate ions? Carbonate ions produce the effervescence of carbon dioxide in the presence of acid. So B. Dilute sulfuric acid would react with carbonate and produce carbon dioxide as bubbles. B. Methyl benzene reacts with a mixture of concentrated nitric acid and concentrated sulfuric acid. So that makes NO2+. Plus. The NO2 plus accepts a pair of electrons from the ring of the benzene and it replaces an H on the ring with an NO2 group. So it's elect this is an electrophile and electron pair acceptor and it replaces an H. So it's electrophilic substitution. So the answer is B. Question 21. Which mechanism is not used? Well, I've got a CH3. Uh, carbon here, CH3, that's a methyl group there, and the methyl group, one of the H's, has been replaced by a Cl. So that's free radical substitution using UV light and chlorine, chlorine radical. Um, here, then, I've got an OH minus replacing the Cl. I've probably got something like sodium hydroxide in cold water doing nucleophilic substitution, so the OH minus would attack that C there. Uh, this C and bond onto that C and the Cl would be replaced nucleophilic substitution so it's not B and then um, I've got um, something like an acyl chloride reacting here uh, via addition elimination so an acyl chloride would react with this and make HCl as a condensation reaction um, that's addition elimination so the answer that's not used is A electrophilic substitution which compound is formed from one phenyl ethanol? We need to know what one phenyl ethanol is. Phenyl is a benzene group. Um, uh, phenyl ethanol, here's ethanol, uh, CH, uh, CH3, CH2OH. Um, so at carbon number one, um, here, here's the carbon number one of the ethanol. I've got a phenyl group at carbon number one. That's one phenyl ethanol. Um, 
and then with acidified potassium dichromate. So acidified potassium dichromate turns OHs into carbon to oxygen double bonds. I'm going to get phenyl ethanone. I'm going to get C, uh, C. 6H5, that's the ring, C double bond O, C double bond O, when the acidified potassium dichromate turns this um, secondary alcohol into a ketone group, a C double bond O, and then I've got my CH3. So my answer is C. Question number 23, I've got some reagents added to four organic compounds which show which row shows the correct observations? Well, let's run down each column first of all. Sodium hydrogen carbonates. Carbonates produce effervescence of carbon dioxide in the presence of um, acids. So propanoic acid effervescence. Propanone and propanal are not acids. Uh, Propanol is an alcohol. So this is the only acid. Um, so propan one all is incorrect. Um, so why would propan one all? It's not an acid to produce effervescence. It wouldn't. So I'm going to rule A out. Acidified potassium dichromate. Acidified potassium dichromate reacts with um, primary alcohol. So it would react with A, but would rule. A out. It will actually also react with propanal and turn it uh, an aldehyde, turn it into a carboxylic acid if you heat it, if you reflux it. So that's correct. No visible change. No, um, I haven't got um, uh, an alcohol group here. I haven't got an alcohol group in propanoic acid. So all of those are correct. So I'm um, between B, C, and D on Tollens reagent. Tollens tests for um, aldehydes. So B, silver mirror, is correct. That's an aldehyde. These two are not aldehydes, so why would they produce a silver mirror? They wouldn't. So my answer is B. Which compound is formed by the acid hydrolysis of phenylmethylethanoate? We need to first, first of all work out what phenylmethylethanoate is. Well, let's work out what methylethanoate is first of all, and then put a phenyl group onto the methyl group. So methylethanoate, ethanoate looks like that. It's an ester C double bond O, O. Methyl, you always start labeling the nester from the right hand side. Methyl, and then two carbons, eth. And then this C double bond O, O is uh, uh, an ester ethanoate, methyl ethanoate. Okay, now I've got a phenyl group, and the phenyl group is on the methyl, phenyl methyl. So this is my methyl, I've got a phenyl group, which is another word for a benzene ring. So this is phenyl methanoate. Now when it's hydrolyzed, hydrolysis is a reaction with water. It's acid catalyzed. It breaks this ester bond. This ester bond gets broken by water and it forms a carboxylic acid group, COOH. And this O here will form an alcohol. So this part here forms this alcohol. So I'm going to get ethanoic acid and I'm going to get this compound here. This compound here looks as if it is a C6H5, that's the ring C6H5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, CH2OH. So my answer is A. A student is required to dry a liquid sample of pentanoic acid. Which drying agent is suitable? Well, calcium oxide and calcium sulfur are both good drying agents. So it's either A or B. Uh, so which is preferable? Well, if you have an acid, calcium oxide, metal oxides, anything on the left-hand side of the periodic table are metals in group 1 and 2. Um, and so calcium oxide is um, a basic compound. Any metal oxides are basic, so that's going to react with the pentanoic acid. So I would choose calcium sulfate. Um, uh, that's not basic. It's not going to react with acids. Um, I would choose B. So between A and B, both good drying agents, calcium oxide, uh, metal oxides are bases. Bases react with acids. Not a good idea. Calcium sulfate is your better choice. 
Here, the reaction between propanol chloride and benzene is an example of acylation, uh, which is a correct representation of part of the mechanism of this reaction. Right? I've got some horror stories going on here. Uh, my answer is C. So what I've got is I've got ethanol chloride, CH3, CH2, CO, and it's had a Cl. I've reacted it with the aluminium trichloride, AlCl3, that's formed AlCl4 minus, and I have to plus charge here. And this is um, uh, an example of um, then um, electrophilic uh, substitution. So this group is going to join on to the ring. It's an electrophile electron pair acceptor and it's going to replace an H on the ring. So C is correct. Um, 27. Methylamine reacts with bromoethane by substitution produce a mixture of products which compound is not a possible product for this reaction. So we need to go through the steps. Methylamine is this, methyl with an NH2 amine. With bromoethane, this is CH3CH2Br. The N with a lone pair of electrons bonds onto this C here and releases the Br. So I form CH3CH2NH, it'll lose an H as well when it bonds on CH3. So it forms this. Um, CH3, CH2, Br is replaced, NH2, N bonds onto that C with a lone pair of electrons. The Br is released uh, and the CH3 is still on the N. It's going to lose an H as well. Then this reacts again. So the lone pair of electrons here will attack this C again. Uh, the Br again will be released. So I'll end up with CH3, CH2, um, N, the H will be lost, CH3, CH2, and a CH3. And then again, this N here has got a lone pair of electrons, going to attack that C. So I'm going to get another CH2, CH3. I'm going to get three of those formed now, and a CH3. And the N, which has just used its lone pair of electrons to bond here, I'll have a plus charge. It's not got an H to get rid of which could donate its electrons back onto the N and get rid of the plus. So the plus stays and I've got quaternary ammonium salt. So which one is it uh, is a possible, is not a possible reaction um, is D. Two CH3 groups. I've never got two CH3 groups. The answer is D. Which polymer has hydrogen bonding between its chain? Well, I know it's definitely not polyethene. That's just um, ethenes that have had the double bond broken uh, and form sit long uh, chains of single bonds. Um, and PVC polyvinyl chloride isn't either there. Addition polymers. Terylene is a poly, um, polyester. Kevlar is a polyamide with... Um, a peptide link in it. So my answer is A. Let's have a look at those then. So this is Kevlar with benzene rings separated by um, polyamide links, C double bond O, NHs, C double bond O, NHs. And so I've got N to H uh, here. I'm going to have hydrogen bonds between the chains. This is polyethene where the C to C has had a double bond and it's broken and I've got an addition polymer. PVC is very similar except one of the H's is replaced by a Cl before you uh, polymerize it. So I've got CH2, CH, Cl with a double bond as a monomer. And terylene um, has, is a polyester. So I've got dipole-dipole attractions but I haven't got any uh, hydrogens bonded to oxygen. So my answer is Kevlar A. Um, I can also remember that because uh, Kevlar is very strong, used to make bulletproof vests and uh, motorcycle helmets and hydrogen bonding will help strengthen the bonding between that structure, between those chains. Which structure shows part of a peptide link in a protein? Well, a peptide link is a C double bond O N H, um, a bit like this being a peptide link here in Kevlar. Um, I've got two of those, funnily enough, both of these. There's a C-O-N-H, C-O, and a C-O-N-H. But you never get um, 
two COs separate, separated by an NH in a protein, not when amino acids join together. So my answer is D, a simple peptide link. Two strands of DNA are joined together by hydrogen bonds, which is correct. Well, I've refer to my data book, and on every O and every single N, I put a lone pair of electrons, and then I bond those in hydrogen bonds going round in rainbows between uh, the, the bases, then the lone pair of electrons on the oxygen bonds to the delta plus uh, on the H, because remember this, uh, uh, this is a polar bond here between the NH2s, so make all the NH2s polar bonds, delta plus is on the H's of the NH's, the delta plus bonds to the lone pair of electrons on O's and single N's. Here I've got an NH with a delta plus on the H, going round and bond into a lone pair of electrons on the N. Lone pair of electrons on the O will bond to the delta plus on the H there. So I've got three bonds between guanine and cytosine. NH2, delta plus on the H of the NH2 on that polar bond, will hydrogen bond then to the lone pair of electrons on the O. And I've got an NH here, I've got a delta plus on the H, will hydrogen bond round to the N with the lone pair of electrons. So let's have a look. Adenine and guanine form two hydrogen bonds. Adenine and guanine, no adenine bonds to thymine, so that's incorrect. Cytosine and thymine. Cytosine bonds to guanine, not thymine, so that's incorrect. Guanine bonds to cytosine. Guanine does indeed bond to cytosine. Now, I do get three hydrogen bonds. That's correct. Let's just check the last one. Adenine and thymine. Adenine and thymine do indeed bond together. They're complementary bases, but they only form two hydrogen bonds, not three. So the answer is C, which is not responsible for the conduction of electricity. So conduction electricity is where you get electrons on the move called delocalized electrons. Sodium ions, well ions are plus charges, um, so sodium, sodium ions are Na plus charges. In molten means it's liquid, these ions can move, these plus charges can move, so that would conduct electricity. Electrons between the layers of carbon atoms in graphite, they're delocalized between layers and layers in graphite. Bonding electrons in a metal, yes, the electrons get delocalized around in a metal and it conducts electricity. You probably know that graphite and um, metals conduct electricity anyway, so B and C are fairly obvious to be true. Lone pairs of electrons and water molecules, no, they're, they're bonded to the, um, to the oxygen, they're not delocalized, so my answer is D. Question 32. In the, UK in the UK, industrial ethanol is now produced by direct hydration of ethene. So ethene's got a double bond. Hydration is addition of water as opposed to dehydration, which is removal of water. So I'm adding water across the double bond. This process has largely replaced the fermentation method. What's the likely reason for this change in the method? The direct hydration route produces pure ethanol. It does, so it'll produce one product, whereas through fermentation you might get a mixture of products, especially if it oxidizes some of the alcohol um, into um, an aldehyde or a carboxylic acid. Um, so A is correct, but let's just check through B, C and D. The direct hydration route employs milder conditions. Now, the water um, needs to be heated, so it needs to be steam. The direct hydration route does not use a catalyst. Yes, it uses phosphoric acid as a catalyst. And the direct hydration route produces ethanol in a slower reaction. Now, fermentation is very slow. Uh, the direct hydration route is quick. So the answer is A. Which alkene produces, uh, reacts with hydrogen bromide to give 2-bromo-3-methylbutane as the major product? I think I need to draw that and see that. 2-bromo-3-methylbutane, uh, 2-bromo-3-methylbutane. This is 2-bromo-3-methylbutane here. But 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, 4 carbons, butane. 2-bromo, this is carbon number 1. The bromo is at number 2. And the methyl groups at one, two, three. So I've, I've got this, and um, I've added hydrogen bromide. So if I add hydrogen bromide across this double bond here, then the H will go with the CH2s and leave 
a plus here and the Br minus with its lone pair of electrons will attack this plus here, this secondary stable carbocation. Um, so this will form it. So my answer is D. CH3 twice, two CH3s, CH, that's a C, it's got three carbons around it, so it's got a high, an, H, an H bonded to it as well. CH, CH here, CH2 with a double bond between. The answer is D. Which compound can be purified by forming a hot aqueous solution that recrystallizes on cooling? So we usually do it with something like recrystallization. We do it with something like aspirin. I'm looking for a solid. Uh, what do we know that's a solid? Cyclohexene. Well, um, cyclohexene is a liquid. Ethanoic acid is also known as vinegar. Phenylamine is a liquid. Benzoic acid. Um, benzoic acid, uh, it's got carboxylic acid groups. Um, it's quite a big molecule with a benzene ring. So it's going to have lots of hydrogen bonds it's a big molecule benzoic acid carboxylic acid group it's got o's bonded to h's in there so it's going to have hydrogen bonds it's got c double bond o's it's got dipole dipole so this is definitely a solid benzoic acid because it's got hydrogen bonding dipole dipole attractions it's intermolecular bonds and it's got um large van der waals bonds as well with it being a large molecule so d is my solid Use the data booklet to help you answer this question. Which is the main aspartic acid species present in the aqueous solution of pH 14? That's basic or alkali. Uh, alkalis or bases like sodium hydroxide remove H pluses. H pluses, remember, is acid, so the uh, bases, uh, pH 14, will, will react with acids and remove H pluses. So, which ones of these have had the H pluses removed? The answer is D, where the COOHs have become COO minuses. This uh, has had the H pluses removed by a base or an alkali. This one has to as well, but it's as witteri in this, um, where I've got H plus on there so that will happen at a certain pH called an isoelectric point so this one so if we get COO minuses it's a high pH in something like sodium hydroxide something like this with NH3 pluses has had the H pluses added by an acid this would be at low pH the answer is D